Tonight, breaking news as we come on the air, the deadly ramming at an Apple store near Boston, an SUV plowing through the glass storefront, killing at least one person and injuring more than a dozen. What officials are saying about the driver of that car and the investigation now underway. Also tonight, the chilling new details in that nightclub massacre, the alleged gunman expected to be charged with a hate crime and first degree murder for killing five people at an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado. What we're now learning about the suspect's criminal past, including this new video of a standoff with police just last year, and the tales of heroism emerging as tributes for the victims pour in. Brink of collapse, parts of New York buried under nearly eight feet of snow, residents rushing to clear their roofs, some buildings buckling under all that weight, the death toll climbing tonight, plus your holiday travel forecast just moments away. Challenging Trump, the biggest names in the GOP, taking aim at the former president just days after he declared his run for the White House. How the former president is firing back on his own social media site, despite Elon Musk letting him back on Twitter. Jay Leno released the first image of the comedian since he was burned in a garage fire. What his doctors are now saying about his recovery. And World Cup kickoff, Team USA tying with Wales in their first match of the competition. But it was a pregame moment that made headlines. What the Iranian national team did that had some spectators in tears. Top Story starts right now. And good evening. We have a lot to get to tonight, but we begin with that breaking news out of Boston, a horrific scene at an Apple store with the busy holiday shopping season now underway. An SUV, you can see it there, ramming through the glass storefront in a shopping center in Hingham. Police say several shoppers were pinned between the vehicle and the wall. You can see the massive hole it left behind, shattered glass littering the sidewalk. At least one person killed. That victim identified late tonight as a professional who was on site to assist with construction. The injured taken out of the bitter cold and triaged in a neighboring restaurant. Investigators now on the scene working to determine if the cause of the deadly crash and whether or not it was intentional. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez leads us off tonight. The SUV plowed through the front of the Apple store just before 11 a.m., shattering glass and pinning shoppers against a wall. We need a whistle up here to try and pull the car out. We got four people trapped in front of the car against the wall. At least one person dead, 16 others rushed to the hospital. All of a sudden, we hear this, it's like, I don't want to say explosion, but a bang, like a very loud bang. So we jumped up from the table and looked out the window. We could see the hole in the Apple stores. In frigid temperatures, emergency responders using a nearby restaurant to triage patients. We have patients who are uh, in the operating room and uh, patients that we anticipate going to the operating room. A horrifying scene during a holiday week at a popular shopping mall in Hingham, Massachusetts, a Boston suburb. It's very sad, it's, yeah. especially the week of leading into Thanksgiving. This is crazy. We're from out of town, uh, and this is absolutely insane. Authorities have not said what caused the SUV to smash into the store or how fast it was going. This is an ongoing and active investigation, and we are not able to provide any further details at this time. Late today, the SUV was removed from the store as Apple confirmed the person who died was involved in recent construction there. The company adding, we are devastated by the shocking events. Our hearts go out to our team members and customers who were injured. This morning was an unthinkable morning, and people are trying to get through it and process what happened. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now in studio. Gabe, it was a scary scene there in Boston. Now we know it was also a deadly scene. Do we know yet if this was intentional because this happened earlier this afternoon? Uh, yeah, Tom, we don't know quite yet. Authorities have said that this is an active criminal investigation, but they do not know, or at least they have not said, whether this is intentional or if it was accidental. But as you said, it's just a horrifying scene. This happened just after the Apple store opened, and now authorities have revealed that uh, the victim's name is a 65-year-old from New Jersey. Just heartbreaking. And you know these Apple stores, they are so iconic. They're all built sort of the same way with those glass front interiors that we've seen there. From some of the eyewitnesses, at first I know they thought it was an explosion because the impact was so loud. Right. I guess it speaks to how fast possibly this driver was going. Yeah, and some witnesses have said that this driver was 
was going at a high rate of speed. And, you know, you might think that if it was accidental, perhaps the driver might have been inching forward. But in this case, we know that the SUV made it pretty far into the store. Apple stores do not have walls, very open. And, of course, as you know, especially around this time right. of busy holiday season, you can imagine how many people were in there, several of them seriously injured, Tom. All right, Gabe Gutierrez. Gabe, leaving us off tonight. Now to another tragedy, a mass shooting at an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado this weekend. Five people killed, more than 18 people hurt, with police saying the gunman started firing immediately after walking in using a semi-automatic rifle. Officials now investigating the 22-year-old suspect as the community is left in shock. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is on the ground for us tonight from Colorado Springs. 48 hours after a deadly barrage inside a packed club queue, authorities shared critical new details in the investigation. 22-year-old Anderson Lee Aldrich, arrested on suspicion of five counts of first-degree murder and five counts of bias-motivated or hate crimes causing bodily injury. It's important that if we have enough evidence to support bias-motivated crimes, to charge that. It's important for this community. It was just before midnight Saturday when the packed LGBTQ hotspot turned deadly. It was rapid fire. By the time the shooting spree was over, five people were killed. Another 18 others injured, including Jericho Valle, who was shot in the leg. One of the patrons had subdued him, got him to the ground and held him down, face down, until the police had arrived. Veteran Richard Fierro allegedly tackled the suspect and beat him with his own gun. I don't know exactly what I did. I just went into combat mode, he told the Times. I just know I have to kill this guy before he kills us. I have never encountered a person who had engaged in such heroic actions that was so humble about it. He simply said to me, I was trying to protect my family. Although what he tell NBC, the gunman has said little, if anything, to investigators, and that his mother, whom he lived with, is currently not cooperating. They uh, did a search warrant on his house yesterday. Those types of things tend to lead to a pretty good picture of uh, you know, what was going on in this individual's mind. Investigators now looking into a prior arrest involving the suspect, according to the district attorney. This video, provided by his mother's former landlord, shows him in a 2021 standoff with police after allegedly making a bomb threat at his mother's home. Last year's arrest confirmed by a news release from the sheriff's office. What about that Facebook live stream? That was really, really shocking. Leslie Bauman says she recorded this Facebook right live stream of Aldrich voicing threats from yeah, inside the home as out. police arrive. If they breach, I'm going to blow it to holy Officials have yet to confirm that suspect is the man involved in Club Q shooting. Tonight, the chaos from late Saturday now leaves a tight-knit LGBTQ community in mourning. These weren't just people in a club. These... My friends, people that have known me for years. Their safe space turned into a tragic crime scene. All right, Morgan Chesky joins us now live from Colorado Springs. Morgan, I, I want you to walk us through that video we saw in the report of that previous incident last year. Because some people are going to be asked, should this person have been on the radar of police? Yeah, Tom, that question, of course, being asked by a lot of folks here in Colorado Springs. That video we showed you, there are two. The first is from a ring camera that was shared with us by the homeowner, who was the former landlord of the mother of this suspect. He, of course, was able to visit uh, regularly, and she tells us that she was driving home when she got a phone call from that suspect's mother uh, telling her, don't come home right now. It was shortly thereafter she found out that he had made a bomb threat that police had told her that someone was inside her home uh, and then he was taken into custody uh, where we mentioned he had that charge of the bomb threat uh, amongst several others however important to know here Tom uh, there was never any formal charges made against him uh, essentially that investigation stopped and that's why a lot of people are saying had that been followed through uh, perhaps it could have been a warning sign that could have saved lives here uh, late last Saturday and, um, and Morgan talking about the current investigation now despite being held on suspicion of murder and hate crimes more even more charges could be coming yeah, officials were clear to say that these are just the charges he is being held on, that as this investigation deepens, more charges could follow. Uh, we're also hearing that the DOJ is looking into potentially uh, 
exploring federal hate crime charges. But on these murder charges alone, Tom, this suspect is looking at life in prison uh, without the possibility of parole. Tom. Morgan Chesky for us. And now to the harrowing stories of those who survived and those who did not. NBC Steve Patterson is also in Colorado tonight as he speaks with survivors of the deadly club shooting and we learn more about the community's painful path to recovery. Tonight, a spectrum of sadness as police release the names of five victims killed in another senseless mass shooting. Ashley Paw, Derek Rump, Kelly Loving, Raymond Green Vance, and Daniel Aston. Daniel's mother says he had an uncanny ability to uplift. He lit up a room. Yeah, it's this old expression, but he... He really did. Um, yeah, always smiling, always happy. As bursts of gunfire drowned out Club Q's booming music and cheerful shouts morphed into panic screams, survivor Ed Sanders says he walked right into the path of the gunman. The shooting started and I got hit in the back. Then he fired another volley and uh, I got hit in the leg and then I went down. But even as Sanders recovers in the hospital, he remembers the woman laying next to him and a group of survivors banding together to save lives. I could hear people calling for tourniquets and the lady next to me was shot pretty badly and uh, we were trying to keep her breathing. That community spirit is no surprise. Ed says he went to Club Q for the same reason everyone does. For the LGBT community, it felt like home. Club Q has been my home for 20 years. But right now, a place of shock and mourning. It was just really, really, really scary. Bartender Michael Anderson says he was barely able to hide. I saw like a, a silhouette of a person coming in and I saw them holding a rifle or a gun or like a long gun and um, this, this, the pops kept happening. So I jumped beneath the bar, and as I did, that glass was flying all around me. Anderson says the chaos suddenly stopped when two patrons rushed the shooter, an act he says is the reason why he's still alive. I don't know who stopped him, but I'm grateful because they most certainly saved my life. Sanders is now on a long road to recovery, including another surgery tomorrow, but so desperately wanted to speak and to say this. I want people to just show some love to the LGBT people in their lives. Steve Patterson joins us now live from Colorado Springs as well. Steve, it's incredible to hear from that victim who, who just a couple nights ago was shot and wants to go on national television now to make sure people think about this community. We've heard so much about how that club was a safe haven for that community. What are you hearing from other survivors? You know, Tom, if I could, I would have everybody at home think about all the places they go to on a daily basis and still feel like their true selves, still feel safe. Well, the LGBTQ community here tells me there were maybe only a handful of places like that. And the biggest, brightest, safest one before this weekend was that club. So to have this happen is a deep wound in this community, but one that everybody here tells me will heal. Tom. Steve Patterson for us tonight. Steve, we thank you for that. We just heard from a few survivors tonight on Top Story, two more of those survivors. We are grateful to be joined now by Gil Rodriguez and Felicia Juvera, who were also at Club Q during that shooting. Thank you to the both of you for joining me. I know this is still very hard, and I'm sure you're still in a state of shock. Gil, I want to start with you. You're a veteran. What went through your mind when you heard those first shots ring out? Um, to be honest, the, the first couple shots, um, I, I think everyone in the club was in agreement that we honestly thought it was part of the music that was playing. They were playing hip hop at the time. And, um, I think everyone was kind of, when I was kind of scoping out the room, I think everyone was confused. They weren't sure if it was part of the song, the music, or if it was actually really happening. Um, I think after the, the second one, I, I kind of, my instincts kind of kicked in a little bit, um, you know, with my military background, and I just kind of sprung into action. And what did you do, Gil? Kind of, uh, um, so basically what I did was I flipped the table that we were near uh, to kind of use it as cover because the floor was pretty wide open. There was really no no cover whatsoever. Um, so I flipped, started by flipping the table. I um, looked to her, I, I pulled her down, and I just yelled in the room, everyone get down. Um, 
And, you know, we just kind of went in a prone position, just kind of facing away from where the fire was coming from, just to kind of protect our our heads and, and our bodies. Um, I, I felt a, a bullet graze my foot, which kind of like led me to kind of react as well, because by logic, you know, it was kind of facing our shooting in our direction. So I kind of jumped on top of her to kind of shield her to prevent, you know, her from potentially getting struck by a stray bullet or anything like that. And um, and then the shots just continued going from there. Felicia, Gil reacted so quickly to protect you. What were you seeing? What, what were you hearing? And and could you believe that you were in a mass shooting situation? Not at all. Um, I think, as Gil stated, you know, your mind just kind of immediately goes into um, just act quickly. Um, so when I heard the shots, I, I truly didn't know they were gunshots, to be honest. It was the smell that kind of got to us in regards to that, the gunpowder. Um, and him acting so quickly, I was thankful, truly, um, just because our backs were exposed. And if that shooter, he was, if he was not shooting in a spray effect, because um, he was aiming directly at our backs. So I was thankful for him. And Gil, you, you and Felicia were there to support the DJ, who's a friend of yours. I understand she was shot in this? Correct. Yeah, yeah she was shot in the back. Could, could you tell? Like the first person that we saw. Um, honestly, at first, we, we didn't know it was the extent of her injuries. Um, once the smoke cleared and, um, you know, I kind of was directing everyone out the back door towards the alleyway, um, which leads to the parking lot. Um, we saw her lying there, like on her back. Um, we, she was just screaming, you know, help. Um, you know, so we didn't really know the extent of her injuries, how many times she got shot, mm -hmm. where she got shot at. We were just kind of being very careful with Caution. moving her, you know, or whatnot, because we didn't know where she was hit at, because we didn't see any blood at the time. Um, there was a lot of victims in the alleyway as well, which um, I was kind of looking at as well. Gil, I mean, I, I, I know we hear about these mass shootings all the time. Unfortunately, in this job, we have to talk about them and cover them all the time. Um, did, it, did it register for you what, what was happening and, and that you were now in the scene of a mass shooting and then seeing all those casualties, including your friend, bleeding there on the floor? Yeah, it was, um, you know, it's kind of surreal, um, you know, just because everything just happened so fast. I guess I just didn't truly understand the extent of how mm -hmm. how bad everyone was hurt until we got to that back alley portion because the club itself is very dark. Like, you really can't see much in there. Mm -hmm. So when we got outside, we saw our friend Tara lying there, um, shot in the back. Um, there was two other females back there. One was shot in her face. You know, she was holding her face, um, you know, together. The uh, other female that was next to her, she got shot twice in her arm. You know, her ja jacket was soaked in blood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of went out to the back alley, like towards the parking lot area um, to ensure the shooter wasn't out there, you know, kind of just waiting for people to, you know, start trickling out of the club um, where I, you know, discovered a couple more um, victims that were affected as well. And I kind of just told them to, you know, kind of stay where they were. Um, so I kind of had an idea on who needed the most medical attention. And I kind of directed first responders to um, everyone who needed the most immediate attention. Fel Felisa, you, you, have you been able to speak to your friend? Is, is, is she okay? And then what do you think about the people who stopped the shooter? What, what would you like to say to them tonight? We have been, we've had updates of our friend who's thankfully going to be okay, um, who got shot and they removed only her appendix. So thankfully she is going to make a great recovery. Um, to those guys who um, took down the shooter, we're so grateful, um, truly, um, because I think without them, it would have been much worse. I mean, it is really bad, but... Um, I don't know if I'd be sitting here today. So I would just appreciate them. Felisa Juvera, Gil Rodriguez, we thank you for your time tonight. We do want to turn now to that monster storm cleanup in the Northeast. We were covering it a lot last week, you may remember, in Buffalo. Many people are still digging out from that historic and deadly snowstorm that crippled much of western New York. And tonight there are still safety concerns with mountains of snow on the ground and rooftops. Jesse Kirsch has more. Nearly seven feet of snow pounded western New York. We've been digging and digging and digging. Buffalo navigating its fourth day under feet of snow and bitter cold temperatures. Several people throughout the park have lost either their hot water tanks or their heat. Even though the snow has stopped, there were still threats. How concerning is it to see that much snow on roofs? We're getting phone calls from uh, not only business owners, but also um, people living in their homes that are saying they're, they're hearing 
cracking and popping and, and, and loud noises that are concerning and, and seeing cracks appearing in their ceilings. Orchard Park's police chief says snow caused this structure to collapse. It also caught fire. It's why some are now shoveling not just in front of their homes, but on top of them. Why do you have to be up there right now? Well, uh, worried about if you walk in there, you'll see it like this. It's bowed, the roof. This is four feet of snow on top of this. 80-year-old Richard Tojak and his son are trying to tear apart this blanket of snow. So you're hoping the sun's going to help out? Oh, it, oh, definitely will. Relief trickling in after a historic storm blamed for three cardiac-related deaths and about 280 rescues. From Thursday into Sunday, lake effect snow created near whiteout conditions and impassable roads. Orchard Park 66 inches in just 24 hours, now the highest one day snowfall in New York history. We like being number one in a lot of things, but I think this one we're going to look back on and wish we weren't number one in. All right, Jesse Kirsch joins us tonight from Buffalo. Jesse, this is a massive cleanup effort with all that snow, I have to imagine. And we saw this in your report, getting all this snow out of the way. It's not going to be easy. And in some cases, it's dangerous. Yeah, and Tom, you might be able to hear it. You can probably see it behind us. We are just south of Buffalo itself in Lackawanna, where they have been piling snow by the dump truck load for days, and they keep bringing it through. They've got excavators pushing it up into these giant mounds that tower over my head. And officials here believe this could be going on possibly through Thanksgiving, just to give you an idea of how much snow they have here right now. And Jesse, schools have been closed there since late last week. Any word on when they'll reopen? Yeah, so we do have uh, the communities here slowly reopening more and more. The travel bans that we've seen have now gone away as of this evening. But the city of Buffalo itself is still going to have its public schools closed again tomorrow, Tom. All right, Jesse Kirsch for us. He's been weathering that storm for days there in Buffalo. For more on the record-breaking storm and what's coming next, NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns joins us now in studio. So, Bill, I guess what's the outlook here for those folks in the Northeast? Will the temperatures rise at all to melt that snow? Right. Like we want to melt it, and also we don't want a rainstorm to you know, go on those roofs. I mean, snow acts like a sponge, so that would be horrible for the weight, so we don't want that to happen either. First, let's recap. We had two different locations, Orchard Park where the Bills play in Hamburg. Both were over 80 inches. To give that some perspective, Josh Allen, the Buffalo Bills quarterback, is six foot five. That's 77 inches. So a lot of people in western New York were saying this was a Josh Allen snowstorm, just to give you a perspective of how high that was. So what are we going to be dealing with? Temperatures have been rising. Buffalo right now, the wind chills at 32. That's bearable. It's better than what it has been. And now we're going to start to do a slow moderation. It's not going to melt in a hurry. It's going to be a slow melt. That's okay. We'll deal with it. 41 tomorrow in Buffalo. And you notice a lot of the rest of the country is starting to warm up too. Kansas City at 57. Still cold by Texas standards. But then as we even go towards Wednesday, the big travel day, still 41 in Buffalo, but 60 in St. Louis. We're heading in the right direction. And then looking ahead at the end of the week and, yes. and the Thanksgiving travel back, what's it looking like? Yeah, getting there looks great. I mean, I've never even seen a forecast this quiet for three, four days before Thanksgiving. So as we go through the forecast, here's how we're going to look tomorrow. We're going to be sunny and nice, eastern half of the country, no problem. Maybe some snow showers in the west. By the time we get to Thanksgiving Day, let's fast forward, we could be looking at some rain problems in areas of the deep south. So keep that in mind for any of your outdoor plans with your family, uh, anywhere from Louisiana up through Arkansas. East coast looks pretty good. But then by the time we get to Friday, we will be watching some rain on the eastern seaboard. So uh, again, not picture perfect after Thanksgiving, but getting there no problem. All right. Maybe stay, stick around a day or two with the, with the family. All right, Bill. Thanks so much for that. Turning now to politics as potential Republican presidential hopefuls are gearing up for the 2024 election and to take on former President Donald Trump. Even some of his once closest allies now fiercely denouncing him. Trump firing back and Garrett Haig has it all. Donald Trump is blasting critics in his own party tonight, defending his MAGA candidates who took heavy losses in the midterms, echoing his false claims of a stolen election. The former president posting to social media, quote, candidates who shifted their messaging after winning big in the primaries, Bolduck, saw big losses in the general. Will they ever learn their lesson? You can't win without MAGA. Trump speaking via satellite at the Republican Jewish Coalition meeting in Las Vegas over the weekend as the only declared candidate for president. We have to stay strong and we have to fight. And frankly, uh, you better hope that a certain person wins the election in 2024. Doubling down on his platform amid questions about this latest run. When we win in 2024, the era of backstabbing and betrayal will end and the United States will stand with Israel once more, just as it did in 
my administration. The former president met with intense opposition from potential Republican challengers. The job of a leader is to take the arrows so that his people doesn't have to. So I always said throughout all that, I am much more worried about protecting the jobs of the people that I represent than I'm worried about saving my own. Let the politics sort itself out. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and potential Trump adversary continuing to hint at a 2024 bid. We've accomplished more over a four-year period than anybody thought possible. But I can tell you this, we've got a lot more to do, and I have only begun to fight. Even some of Trump's previously close allies launching criticism at the former president, including one of his closest advisors. We keep losing and losing and losing. And the fact of the matter is the reason we're losing is because Donald Trump has put himself before everybody else. And his former secretary of state. Personality and celebrity just aren't going to get it done. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley says she's just getting started, denouncing Trump's leadership without saying his name. We don't need more politicians who love to go on TV and talk about our problems. We need real leaders with a record of delivering solutions. Former Speaker of the House Paul Ryan coining a new phrase, never again Trumpers. I am a never again Trumper. Why? Because I want to win. And we lose with Trump. It was really clear to us in 18, in 20, and now in 2022. The GOP's new anti-Trump sentiments coming as Trump considers a big return to Twitter. Twitter owner Elon Musk recently reinstating Trump's account. But the former president saying he'll stick to his social media platform, Truth Social, for now. Truth Social has been very, very powerful, very, very strong. And I'll be staying there, but I hear we're getting a big vote to also go back on Twitter. Uh, I, I don't see it because I don't see any reason for it. Looming over all of this Republican infighting, the DOJ announcement Friday appointing Special Prosecutor Jack Smith to consolidate the department's two investigations into Donald Trump, one for January 6th, one for bringing home those documents to Mar-a-Lago at the end of his presidency. Nothing could shake up a presidential primary like a special counsel making a move sometime in the next year. Tom? All right, Garrett Hick for Top Story tonight. Garrett, we appreciate it. Still ahead, the deepening murder mystery in Idaho. Four college students killed more than a week ago, but police have yet to identify a suspect. How authorities are now expanding their investigation to pull in new leads. Plus the massive blaze in New Jersey, several buses going up in flames. Why some are worried that the fire could impact the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And an update tonight on Jay Leno after he was burned in that fire in his garage. The new photo just put out by his doctors. Stay with us. Top story. Just getting started on this Monday. We're back now with a grim new update on that quadruple homicide investigation in Idaho. Police ruling out suspects over the weekend and revealing they think some of the victims could have been asleep moments before their death. Officials assuring the public they are doing what they can to keep this shaking community safe. Gotti Schwartz is there now with the latest. Today, on day nine of the investigation into the killings of four Idaho college students, the crime scene is expanding. A back parking lot behind the home's backsliding doors sealed off, officers combing through a small wooded area. Over the weekend, police releasing solemn details about the murders, including that it's possible some of the young adults might have been asleep in the moments leading up to their deaths. Some of the victims had defensive wounds, and each victim was stabbed multiple times. Officials also revealing the 911 call that alerted them to the slayings was made from the cell phone of one of the surviving roommates, who police say are not suspects. Investigators publicly ruling out several people who came into contact with two of the victims the night they were killed, including a man seen near them outside a food truck and a rideshare driver who took them home. Police are asking for the public's help, issuing a one square mile dragnet, asking for any video from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., they are trying to establish how the killer made it into this house and out of the house. But crime here in Moscow has been rare. This is a city where some people don't lock their doors. It's a place that hasn't seen a murder in seven years, and there are very few cameras in this area. Detectives also looking into seven phone calls made by victim Kaylee Gonzalez to her boyfriend around 2.26 to 2.52 a.m. But Kaylee's family says those calls were not out of the norm and do not suspect he had anything to do with what happened. We do not believe she was calling him for help. We were we believe that she was just calling him to come over. If Kaylee was in, in, in imminent, uh, 
and danger her or Maddie, they would have called 911. They would not have been calling this person. Police say they still think this attack was targeted. Keely's family says they're afraid for others. We fear that this person will do this again. The guilt has got to be just overwhelming. It's There's got to no be hiding. sickening. Stop hiding. Stop running. Just turn yourself in. Gotti Schwartz joins us now from Moscow, Idaho. Gotti, you said it's the type of place where people don't lock their doors in your report. We heard that. I think that's interesting because nowadays so many homes have ring cams or some type of outdoor security cameras. Is this an area where people just didn't have that type of protection because they felt so safe? Absolutely, Tom. I mean, Moscow is a it's a beautiful town. You drive around. We actually drove around that that square mile area. Uh, it's about 400 homes in that area. We saw maybe 50 or 60 of them. We counted three uh, ring cameras out of that. I was talking to somebody a little while ago that lived here for 35 years. They never locked their doors until now. It's just uh, something that was the way of life here in Moscow that has uh, changed for the worse here after these murders. Gotti Schwartz for us. From Idaho tonight. Gotti, we appreciate it. For more on this over week long investigation, I want to bring an associate professor in the Department of Criminology at the University of South Florida and a former FBI special agent, Brianna Fox. Brianna, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. I like having you on the show because you always cut to the chase. So we're now day nine of this investigation. What, what troubles you? What concerns you about this investigation right now? Well, there's one big issue, which is the fact that we're seeing there's a, a indication that there may have been an earlier abuse and actual killing of a dog um, in the nearby area where the murders took place. And that is one major red flag, because that suggests if it's linked, there is escalation, which suggests this could happen again. Brianna, you're, you're talking about, you're referencing a, a, a dog, a, someone's pet who apparently was and, and I, I don't mean to be uh, crass or graphic here, but it, it was it was stabbed and it was killed and apparently it was it was chopped up uh, in a grotesque manner. And, and there is some kind of link. I'm not a criminologist, but there is a link between people who, who would do things like that to an animal and, and other sort of uh, aggressive behavior. Correct. Absolutely. Research shows that uh, when you're looking at people who've been arrested for animal cruelty, about 40 percent have some type of uh, charges for interpersonal violence. And when you're looking even amongst the you know, homicide population, uh, the, there's a substantial portion that have animal cruelty and abuse against animals in their background. So it's definitely a warning sign. Brianna, you know, we don't know much. We know we know that that these these people were stabbed. These poor college students were stabbed. Um, we know that there were some people who were inside the home who somehow survived. We know that that some of the victims tried to defend themselves earlier. And this is I, I know since been walked back, they use the phrase crime of passion. Investigators use that early on. You kind of put these clues together. And I know it's, it's only speculation at this point. But but does does any of that all, all paint any kind of narrative? Yeah, it it initially may have looked like a crime of passion. Knives are typically the weapon that we see used when there's a um, more intimate uh, murder that's known to the killer. The victims are people that they are aware of, or there may even be some you know, anger towards um, that crime of passion in a way. Um, but because this crime was committed against you know, these four roommates, um, two were left unharmed, um, there could be this link to the dog that was killed. It's really suggesting maybe something else. Um, and I'm actually thinking back to uh, a killing that happened in a you know the town that I would l once lived in in Gainesville at the University of Florida. Um, Danny Rawling killed several college students there, also with a knife. So there's some similarities, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's a crime of passion. I, well, I was going to ask you about that because you mentioned Florida, and, and there, there have been you know killers who have targeted college women. A majority of these victims are college age women. Uh, they were in college, I should say. D does that tell us anything about the killer? Well. Typically, uh, serial killers or people that mass kill like this are male, and we often see their victims are female. So that's not necessarily unusual. Um, but one thing, especially in that uh, town, is, you know, why were those victims selected? Was it because they were intoxicated? Was it because they were known to this offender? Um, obviously, they were selected for a reason. Um, it could just be that uh, this was the one uh, house that the offender chose, maybe because it was uh, it didn't have as many onlookers. It just seemed safe. Uh, all of those types of things are what police are going to be investigating. I'm sure they're getting 
hundreds of tips and going through all of them with a fine tooth comb, making sure there's not just one little detail that doesn't crack the whole thing open. I'm sure that's what investigators are working on at this very minute. Brianna Fox, we always appreciate your analysis. We thank you tonight. Coming up, the Christmas parade horror in North Carolina. An 11-year-old killed when a truck pulling a float lost control somehow. The charges the man behind the wheel is now facing and what we're learning about his driving record tonight. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the deadly Christmas parade tragedy in North Carolina. Chilling video showing the moment a truck pulling a float lost control, crashing into a dance troupe and killing an 11-year-old girl in Raleigh. The 22-year-old driver now charged with a misdemeanor death by motor vehicle. Police say the suspect had multiple tickets for failing to have vehicles inspected on his record. He's due in court in January. A massive blaze destroying several buses headed for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Aerial video showing a row of buses engulfed in flames in a parking lot near Newark, New Jersey. The vehicles belong to a company that provides buses and trailers for movie shoots and special events. The company says the fire will not affect Thursday's parade and backups are now on the way. Overseas, a deadly earthquake rocking Indonesia. The 5.6 quake reducing buildings and homes across West Java to rubble. More than 160 people killed and hundreds more injured. The search for survivors is underway, but the quake triggered landslides, and they are blocking rescuers from impacted areas. Officials say thousands of people have been displaced, and the death toll is expected to rise. And back here at home, comedian Jay Leno has been released from the hospital after he was burned in a car fire. You may remember we told you about this news. The Burn Center in Southern California releasing this new image of Leno today. It's the first photo of the comedian since a car in his garage burst into flames, scorching his face, chest, and hands. The center says after a 10-day stay at the facility, he's heading home. They are optimistic, though, he will make a full recovery. Okay, we turn now to Money Talks. Big news from Disney. Bob Iger back in charge in a shocking announcement. Current CEO Bob Chapek is out. Disney announcing Iger will replace him immediately. Thanking Chapek for his service to Disney over his long career, including navigating the company through the unprecedented challenges of the pandemic. This is seen as good news to many Disney fans who have been critical of Chapek's leadership and on Wall Street, where Disney shares rallied up 9%. I want to bring in Robbie Whelan. He covers the Walt Disney Company for the Wall Street Journal. So this surprised a lot of people, Robbie. Iger couldn't have been more clear that he was retiring, but now he's back in. What do we know about this decision? Because the news broke late last night, so it was sort of strange timing as well. Yeah, well, um, it was certainly a surprise to a lot of people inside and outside the company. What we've sort of learned and pieced together over the course of today um, is that it, there was a little bit of a revolt inside the C-suite of the Walt Disney Company, and specifically there was a woman named Christine McCarthy, who's the chief financial officer of the company. She uh, approached the board of directors after um, the company's last earning call, or earnings call, when they reported, you know, pretty weak fourth quarter earnings, and then they went on a call with investors and analysts, and and Bob Chapek, the the, the former CEO was very, very positive, and I think it came off as kind of strange and a little bit tone deaf to a lot of investors. He was talking about how great the future is going to be, how great things are going, when in fact the company was seeing losses in its streaming business widen by almost double. They lost almost a billion and a half dollars last quarter in um, in, in streaming, which is really their main business line right now, and uh, margins were compressing, profits and revenues were kind of down, lower than expectations. And here we had the CEO who was kind of um, talking about things as if everything was kind of okay and no big deal. And so um, the CFO, Christine McCarthy, went to the board and said, look, I've got some major concerns about, um, about Bob Chapek's leadership. Um, this precipitated, you know, a few weeks of kind of hand-wringing and wor- worrying. And then on Friday, um, uh, the, the chair of the board, Susan Arnold, reached out to Bob Iger, who was CEO, of course, for 15 years, and said, look, would you be interested in coming back and helping write the ship? And over the weekend, they negotiated a deal. Um, Bob Iger took over on, on, on Sunday. It was announced to employees on Sunday night, and it's been a big, wild ride since then. In, in full disclosure, I, I worked under both Bobs, uh, and when the transition happened, it, it was sort of strange. It was 
right at the start of the pandemic. But it was clear that Bob Chapek was not Bob Iger, and he wasn't going to try to pretend to be Bob Iger. And everyone knew sort of this was going to be really hard to fill those shoes. But at the same time, the board agreed on this, right? This is what Disney wanted. It's such a powerful company. They had known for a long time that Iger was going to eventually retire. And I know in, 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 in the world of Disney, there was no clear successor, and, and people that had gotten close had somehow mysteriously either didn't work there anymore, they were demoted, or they were straight up fired. But it, it was clear that Chapek was the next in line and he was going to take over. A any idea why Disney played this hand so poorly? Well, um, you're right. I mean, in ad addition to what you just said, Bob Chapek got his contract renewed for almost three years um, in, back in June. And at the time, the board was basically telling anyone who would listen, you know, this guy's got our full confidence and, um, you know, we fully back him. And, uh, of course, you have to remember, all of this is in the middle of a really tumultuous year for Disney. Um, in March, there was a big, high-profile fight between Chapek and the governor of Florida over how much, a how much um, do you think that hurt him? How, how much do you think education that hurt him? bill. How much do you think that hurt him? Because a lot of people it, it said certainly, that wouldn't have happened under him. Iger's watch. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, it certainly, it certainly didn't help him, and it certainly lost him the, conf the confidence of a lot of his employees, which is a key, a key thing here. I mean— um, I, I was going to say, in response to your earlier question about succession, I mean, I, I was talking to one of Bob Iger's close friends today who told me, you know, Bob Iger is a great executive. He's a great leader. He's really good at a lot of things, but succession is not one of them. And it's true. I mean, he, you know, he stretched out his, his retirement announcement over several years. He had two very good candidates in Tom Staggs, the former CFO of Disney, and Kevin Mayer, the former uh, head of strategy and chief operating officer. And um, he, he strung things out for a long time. He really just kind of had some trouble getting off the stage. And so it's a little bit ironic that he's being brought back now to kind of handle the succession plan for Disney now that JPEG is gone. But yeah, you know, Florida did not help. It, um, he lost the confidence of a large chunk of employees for hesitating and not taking a stand on this issue that was important to a lot of them. Um, you know, he, he's done a great job in terms of maximizing profits at the theme parks, but he has not won the hearts of too many fans because he keeps on raising prices for admission, keeps on raising prices for essential add-ons that people need, you know, their smartphone apps and things like that that they need to enjoy their day at the parks. And, and, and furthermore, he just keeps on losing money. This is probably the most important part. He just keeps on losing money in streaming. Um, you know, since Disney Plus launched in late 2019, the streaming business at Disney has lost more than $8 billion. So That's, I want to ask you about and, that and because— losses keep widening. Yeah, that, that leads to my next question. I think this might have been the story that you had a byline on. This is from The Wall Street Journal. It points out, Mr. Chapek previously said he expected the streaming business to be profitable by September 2024, although its losses totaled nearly $1.5 billion for the most recent quarter. I, I don't have to tell you this, but, but streaming was also Bob Iger's baby as well, and now he's back in charge. He's going to have to deal with this. Yeah, one of the things that Chapek did to really set himself apart from Iger was Iger, of course, launched Disney Plus, their flagship streaming business. But Chapek really um, stepped up the expectations in what some people say is kind of an unrealistic way. So, um, you know, a couple years ago at a big investor day conference, Chapek got on the phone with all these investors and said, you know, we're going to have 230 million to 260 million um, Disney Plus subscribers globally by the end of 2024. That was his goal. And he said, and we're going to be profitable by then. Since then, he's had to scale back that subscriber goal. Now the company is saying, you know, it's, it, they've reduced that subscriber target by about 30 million subscribers. And furthermore, on the call two weeks ago, he told investors, we think we're going to be profitable by the end of 2024, but if the economy goes south, we might not be. And that was the first time anybody ever heard them make that kind of caveat. And it was sort of, you know, it caught the ear of investors. The, the, the market really punished them. The, the stock lost 13 percent of its value the following day. It, you know, so it just goes to show kind of that after, you know, telegraphing only confidence and, and perhaps what some might call overconfidence for a long time, you know, when you turn, when you turn that corner into sort of caution and uh, maybe show that you're, you're, you're losing a little bit of confidence, it can have really serious repercussions for the business, for its finances, and for how investors view the business. And 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 Iger's uh, one of his winning qualities was that he was always a couple steps ahead of the competition in mergers and making Disney larger, in in expanding animation. And they're going to have to turn to him now at this turning point in their career and in, in Disney's future to see how he handles streaming. He gets a handle of that, and and if he can 
help it to continue to grow. Uh, definitely beloved by the industry, uh, his industry peers, and the people who work at Disney as well. We're going to have to wait and see how this second run goes for him. Uh, great talking to you today, Robbie. We really do appreciate it. When we come back, the World Cup kickoff, the most popular sporting event on the planet, now in full swing. How Team USA did in their first match against Wales, plus the powerful pregame moment from the Iranian national team that stunned fans. That's next. We're back now with the latest from the global soccer stage. The men's FIFA World Cup kicking off this weekend with blowout wins and even bigger controversies. In this country, all eyes on the U.S. men's national team who tied their first match with Wales today. Megan Fitzgerald is on the ground for us in Qatar tonight. Megan, good evening. Tom, the World Cup is officially underway with host nation Qatar taking on Ecuador in the first match of the tournament, falling 2-0. to zero. But the host nation put on a show at the opening ceremony with fireworks uh, and live performances. Today, controversy. Uh, European teams saying that they were told by FIFA any player that wore these One Love armbands meant to stand in solidarity with marginalized people would automatically receive a yellow card. And, of course, that's something no team can afford at this point. And in, with Iran today, in their match earlier today, they seem to be standing in solidarity with the women of their country fighting for change by not singing the national anthem when it played on the field. And in the stands, we saw fans holding signs that said freedom for Iran. And it was a draw for Team USA today in their match against Wales, making it more challenging for them to advance to the knockout round. Team USA is preparing for their game against England on Friday. Tom? Megan Fitzgerald reporting from the World Cup for us from Qatar. For more on the World Cup, we're joined now by Telemundo anchor Julio Vaquero, who's also there covering all the action. Julio, you've been there since these games kicked off. What's the atmosphere been like in the stadium? Hey, Tom. Uh, it's nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. So it's been, this is a, a historic World Cup. Qataris are really happy to, to be the hosts, and most of them are very, very excited. Uh, but as you know, it's historic because it's the first time a World Cup takes place in the Middle East, and it's the first time a World Cup takes place in one same city. You know, Qatar is basically Doha and desert. So uh, they, all seven stadiums are in one same place. And that, of course, brings a lot of challenges for the local government because we're talking about more than 1,200,000 people coming to one same city during one month. So that's a huge challenge. But the excitement is there and the, the you know, the, the partying and the, uh, the people who love soccer enjoying the moment. So that's basically what, what we're seeing here. And we're seeing some of those festivities just behind you. And I know it's very late there, so I guess the party is still going on. We heard Megan mention the, the armbands controversy, yes. another act of protest occurring before the Iran versus England game. The men's soccer team for Iran refusing to sing the country's national anthem in an apparent act of defiance against their own government. Talk to us about this moment. Well, it was a very powerful moment. You can only Im imagine that, that scene, right? That the players staying there in silence, standing in the middle of the stadium with the, the, every, all the, the people around them uh, listening to the music without them singing. And that's only one of so many controversies around this World Cup since the beginning and since before the beginning of this World Cup, uh, human rights controversies, um, controversies related to, to migrants, migrant workers who were working here and building the stadiums, brand new stadiums, and thousands of them who died working under very high temperatures. And there are so many controversies around this, the, the, the corruption scandal related to FIFA. And that's, that's something that also makes this World Cup so different to others. Uh, because apart from that festivity and the, 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 the passion for, for soccer, there's all this other side of uh, controversies and how so many people are, are looking at this with, with a critical view. Yeah, a lot of different stories coming out of this World Cup. If I can ask for a moment for you to take off your, your newsman hat and put on your sports hat, a lot of people here today are, are, have been watching the, the, the Americans play, and we know that they tied uh, in their first match there against Wales. What, what do people think about the men's national team, the U.S. men's national team? Well, you know, uh, they are the underdogs, but they are also a, a, a strong team, I have to say. And I thought they gave a, a good uh, performance today, although they, they got a tie. Uh, they, they were dominating the game. I thought, I, I thought they were playing good, and, and I hope they do better in the next game. 
And I'm, I mean, if we're talking about taking off the, the journalist hat, then I have to say that I'm looking forward to, for tomorrow's game, Mexico against Poland. And of course, I'm cheering for Mexico. I was going to ask you about that, but I, I already knew the answer to that one. Julio Vaquero, thank you so much for joining us tonight on Top Story. We appreciate it. We thank Julio and Megan, who will be bringing us World Cup action every night right here on Top Story. When we come back, a reminder of the tough sacrifices our military families make as they help keep us safe and free. Tonight, the story of a little girl who is getting a special gift way before Christmas, but just in time. We'll explain right after this break. And finally tonight on this Thanksgiving week, as so many of us are rushing to get home, we bring you the story of an army sergeant giving his daughter an unforgettable surprise. At Oakdale Elementary School in Cincinnati, a group of third graders marking Veterans Day, singing to honor our military and the sacrifices so many men and women, along with their families, make to keep us free. Thank you for your sacrifice. We love you all. I think it's just really important that these kids get a chance just to understand what the roles of our veterans are and how important it is to respect them and to thank them for everything they've done for us. In the choir, eight-year-old Lana Long singing her heart out and thinking of her dad, Army Sergeant Dominic Long. She hasn't seen him in 13 months, and during the concert, she had a special message for him. Dear Dad, thank you for all of you have done. When I see you open, I will hold you as tight as I can. Lana didn't have to wait very much longer because then this happened. Thank you. Welcome for home for the first time in a year. Sorry, Lana. The incredible moment and the tightest of hugs, just like she had promised, leaving some in the audience in tears. I am so grateful that he could be here. It definitely feels great. You know, I missed my daughter, and it just it feels good to be back home. They're now looking forward to the busy week ahead and being together. I can finally spend the night with him and play Minecraft together. Yeah. Because that challenge is still on. <laughs> okay. Music to the ears of a military father, able to see his little girl for the holidays. So glad they're back together. We want to thank our Cincinnati affiliate, WLWT, for their help on that story. And we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.